This week's episode of our show has been sponsored by the Sunken Isles Kickstarter, which is now live. It just launched on February 7th, and for those who back in the first 72 hours, you're going to get a free player's journal if you backed at a physical tier. Sunken Isles is a seafaring adventure for 5th edition that takes your adventure through a magical island chain with a mysterious deity. This book is also going to include lots of new rules for ships and naval combat. This adventure has been headed up by Logan, uh, one of our fellow YouTubers, his channel, Runesmith. You should definitely check it out as well. So follow the links in the description below to check out the Sunken Isles while it's still live on Kickstarter. And now, onto this week's episode. Greetings, my name is Monty Martin. And I'm Kelly McLaughlin. And, and we, we are, are the Dungeon, Dungeon Dudes. Dudes. Welcome to our channel where we cover everything D&D, including advice for players and guides for Dungeon Masters. We upload new videos on Tuesdays and Thursdays, so please subscribe to our channel so that you never miss an episode. Today, we are looking at how to play a Rune Knight fighter in D&D 5e. This amazingly cool archetype for the fighters introduced in Tasha's Cauldron of Everything adds a touch of runic magic to the fighter to create a very unique archetype that has some magical abilities combined with the might of giants. Now with the Rune Knight, we are going to be looking at some of the choices we want to make when building this character. With fighters in general, most of the choices come down to what feats we're going to pick, what race we're going to choose, and how we're going to divvy up our ability scores. With the Rune Knight, one of the other features that we want to make sure to highlight in this video is their runes and how those runes might play with different build options that we come up with. So we're going to be looking at all of those options as we dig into how we might build a Rune Knight in our games of Dungeons & Dragons. There's a lot to discuss, so let's get rolling. With a Rune Knight Fighter, the amount of runes that you gain access to increase at 3rd, 7th, 10th, and 15th level. So we're going to be focusing on those level increases and what runes we might pick. Interestingly enough, with your rune options, there are six runes to choose from, and by 15th level you get to have five of them. So really this becomes a question of more the order that you're going to pick them in and which one is the dud. Even when you gain the Rune Knight archetype right away at third level, you get to have two runes that you have on all the time, and there's six runes, but two of them you can't actually access to level seven. So even from level three to level six, you still get half of the available runes open to you, and at level seven, you still get to choose from half of the available rune options. So it really is about figuring out what is the standout option and which is the one that's gonna fit within the play style that you want for your character and which is the one that you're probably not gonna take. Hint, it's the frost rune. <laughs> Before we get into the details on each of the runes and the racial and ability score options that we might take, let's talk about the abilities that we gain as a rune knight. Aside from the runes, other abilities that we gain, like Giant's Might and the others, are just going to be kind of the icing on the cake for our Rune Knight. They're all great abilities, but we don't really need to worry so much about what our build looks like because these are just going to amplify our Rune Knight regardless. Yeah, Giant's Might is going to allow us to become, be large and in charge, eventually huge, and most of the Rune Knight's other features are basically augmenting the core features anyways. At level 10, our Giant's Might gives us a damage boost and we grow in size. At level 15, we get to use our runes twice as much. And at level 18, we be, be, grow to being a huge size creature when we use Giant's Might. So the big choices for the Rune Knight are gonna be which runes are you gonna bring along and how are you gonna match those with your feats and other build options. So as we go into this, let's look at the core, talk about what races we might play and what ability scores we're gonna take. So first of all, right out the gate, what racial choices might we make for a rune knight in this case i actually think that if you're going for flavor and something that's still going to be really great options for the uh for the rune knight in general i think the goliath stands out here i think the goliath the dwarf the warforged and the half orc all are not only super good but they all feel thematically appropriate for the rune knight it's one of those cases where I love when the mechanics and the flavor come together. It makes for a delicious combination. And so I, with any of these, we're gonna get a nice beefy strength boost, which is what we want. All of them come with a nice beefy constitution boost because the saving throws 
the, the saving throw DC of our Rune Knight abilities is based on our Constitution modifier. So we want to have that nice, good con score. I really personally think that the Goliath is a really cool option um, because of the powerful build features. Just the idea of being of your size category being one size larger for carrying capacity and then also being able to be a large creature has some wonky like physics implications in the universe. I think that as you level up your Goliath, there's a case here that once you can turn into a huge creature, not only are you already a big Goliath, so now you're massive on the battlefield, but with the implications of being able to lift double your carrying capacity or treating it as one size larger, when you're huge, it means that you have the carrying capacity and lifting capacity of a gargantuan creature. So you might be throwing houses at people. I don't know. So there's some really great fun to be had with that. Yeah. At the same time, though, the I think our other top choice is the half-orc because of their uh, savage attack ability and... Um, Relentless endurance as well. Like, so many of the half-orc features are exactly what a fighter wants. Playing a half-orc as a fighter is kind of like getting to pilfer some of your favorite things from the barbarian without having to multi-class. And given the specific combination of the other attributes of what the Rune Knight gets, it kind of feels like you're drinking the Barbarian's milkshake, which you normally would never want to do. That would be very risky to your life. But in this case, you're a Rune Knight, so you can drink that Barbarian's milkshake and they can get as angry as they want, but your runes will protect you. (laughs) Now, our lesser choices, and we'll get into why uh, they conflict with some of the other features, but I do think when we talk about the Dwarf and the Warforged, I especially, for flavor purposes, love the idea of a dwarf who then gets to become bigger on the battlefield. (laughs) Yeah, these are all fun things that are worth worth considering. And once again, given the fact that the customizing your ancestry has really opened the doors on where to put your ability score boosts, essentially with a Rune Knight, we want our con to be high and we want that strength score to be high because we're probably going to go into melee, although you could would play a ranged character with the Rune Knight. It's interesting, none of their abilities require you to use melee attacks. I still think that there's a huge range of options here. I can, I mean, I can see playing a Fearbog Rune Knight. Uh, or, you know, you want to go really off the wall with it, play an Aarakocra or an Owlin or a Tiefling. Almost any of these things work. I love the idea of a gnome uh, Rune Knight. Yeah. Very unexpected, but it's, it's kind of cheeky. When it comes to our ability score attributes, I do think that the Rune Knight, because of their focus on their con, they're going to be tough, they're going to be tanky. It does drive you a little bit towards being on the front lines and thus wearing plate armor, having a high strength score. So I think with a Rune Knight, I would max out strength and con, put both holes at 15. To kick things off, I'm not too worried about what the other ability scores are to be honest (laughs) divvy them up as you see fit pick whatever mental ability score you want to bump up a few points maybe give yourself an okay deck score i'm gonna say this many times throughout the video but there is definitely a play with a rune knight for a ranged character in which case you'll want to put your decks and your con as your highest but for our main focus today we're going to look at the strength based fighter uh but Yeah, again, so many great abilities on the Rune Knight work with a bow, so just keep that in mind as an option. One of the interesting things here as well is that normally Kelly and I are all about the variant human and the custom lineage because we love getting that feat at level one, and it's still good here. That said, if you're going all the way with the Rune Knight and you're taking a whole bunch of fighter levels, you're going to get a lot of feats to begin with. And so while going with the variant human or the custom ancestry lets you jumpstart the build by getting a feat right away at first level... By about level 8, you're already kind of swimming in feats and ability score increases as a fighter, so it's less essential in this case, and so you might find that you gain more from being a half-orc, or from being a goliath, or from having another ancestry, simply because you get more out of that and you've got so many feats that you're like, I don't know what else I'm going to take at this point. So it really depends there, Um, especially because the Rune Knight is not necessarily a character that we want to do the standard fighter archetypes with because so many of the Rune Knight abilities use bonus actions and reactions. So let's level ourselves up to level four. Yeah, so here we have four options for our runes. We can take the Cloud Rune, the Fire Rune, the Frost Rune, or the Stone Rune. 
Uh, we can't get the hill and the storm rune until we are level seven. Yeah, to kick things off with these runes, first thing, let's talk about the fire rune. This is one of my favorite runes. I think that this one is one of the must-haves or really good options. It's a really good go-to. Um, the way the fire rune works, when you carve the fire rune, you double your proficiency bonifier with tools. Kelly and I love tools, and I love having a double proficiency bonus with tools. I wish tools would be used more by game masters and game designers and players in general because they're cool. So this is actually a cool, like, ribbon sort of feature to the rune. But then you can invoke this rune when you hit with an attack. It has to be an attack using a weapon. The attack does an extra 2d6 fire damage, and you summon fiery shackles that restrain the creature. They have to make a strength saving throw against your rune knight save DC. Otherwise, they stay restrained, and they can repeat the saving throw at the end of each of their turns. The shackles otherwise last a minute, but the shackles keep burning them for 2d6 damage while they're trapped inside them. This is great for a variety of reasons. First of all, they're restrained and they're stuck where they are. Second of all, they're going to be taking damage every turn if they can't get out of it. This is also going to mean that you have advantage on additional attacks against that target. If you have other melee combatants around, they are all going to get advantage on this target. And lastly, this does work really well as a ranged attack. Yeah, you're kind of now setting up your allies to get all those advantage attacks, but if a target is trying to run away, if you are the bow-wielding fighter or hucking a javelin, you can hit that enemy that's trying to flee and pin them down. Fiery shackles wrap around them. Everybody gets to catch up and destroy their enemies. Best of all, this doesn't require a bonus action or a reaction or an action to activate. It's just something that you do when you hit with an attack. Of course, you can only use this once before you have to take a short rest to do it again. Um, at 15th level, when you get the extra feature, you can do it twice. But um, it's a pretty decent ability and it can have an impact on most of the battles. So I think the fire rune is one of my first choices for a rune that I would just take and always have it. Yeah, the Fire Rune is our choice for the one that we're going to pick up right away, and we're never going to get rid of it. Next up is the Cloud Rune. This rune passively gives you advantage on Deception and Sleight of Hand checks. If you're a character who's going to be using these, I think Deception is a certain type of character that you want to play. Same with Sleight of Hand, so this is this does feel like the, the lying, stealing sort of character. I just don't think that you're going to have the Dexterity or Charisma scores or the proficiency to really maximize the advantage, but... Whatever, it's there. The main feature they'll hear is that you can invoke the rune as a reaction when a creature you can see within 30 feet of you is hit with an attack. You can then redirect that attack to another creature within 30 feet of you, and it actually is magical in that if it's a melee attack, you can redirect that melee attack to be someone that's not in range of the original attack. This is a really cool way to save a, a party member or yourself from an attack that could kill them while sending some damage back at, at the enemies. This rune in general is somewhat niche in its applications, but when certain instances come online, this rune can be game-changing. And we actually saw an example of this in our <laughs> game. What might be the best case scenario for using a cloud rune was a spellcaster casting plane shift and the cloud ruin deflecting that back at another enemy, and that enemy got plane shifted out of there. Yeah. It doesn't specify a melee or ranged or weapon attack, just an attack. So spells that use attack rolls. Like plane shift when you use it offensively. These work to be deflected as well. Now what's interesting with the cloud ruin is it may not be Monty and my first choice. But at higher level play, yeah. when there are these dangerous game-ending spells, some of which you can deflect back, it might be a later choice. Yeah, I, I think that we kind of had stars in our eyes with this power because we saw it do the crazy thing. <laughs> um, but then you think about it in context other than that, of redirecting a single melee attack as your reaction. And again, you can only do it once. Um in, once and then you need the short rest to get it back again. If this was something that you could use every round or more often, it would be way better. Um, I would definitely consider it at higher levels, especially if you're worried about an ally getting plane shifted. <laughs> but beyond that, uh, it, it's good at redirecting a really big damaging attack 
But until you're seeing those things happen in your campaign, maybe save it. The Frost Rune gives you advantage on animal handling and intimidation checks. Uh, right away, I will say that these two checks are ones that when they do come up, cool, but they're not ones that come up that often. At least these are skills that fighters can be proficient in, and you might have a want to have a good intimidation or a good animal handling check. So can help you out in skill challenges. Invoking the rune gives you plus two to your ability checks and saving throws that use strength and constitution. Considering that your strength and constitution are already going to be high, you're already going to have proficiency in both these saving throws, and you're already probably going to have proficiency in the athletic skill, I think using one of your very limited rune slots to get just a plus two bonus is not worth it. Unfortunately, I think that we're both in agreement here that the Frost Rune, out of all six runes, is probably the one we're leaving on the wayside. Yeah, if this doubled your proficiency bonus, or had... Like, it's good that it gives you a plus two bonus to strength and con saving throws, but your strength and con saving throws are already really good. So a plus two is not a lot in that context, and considering that this has to be... There has to be a rune that is the rune you don't take. This one seems like it's the one. With the stone rune, you gain advantage on insight checks, and you now have dark vision if you didn't have it before, or if you had it, you now get it out to 120 feet, which can be an improvement. Mm -hmm. You can invoke this rune when an enemy ends its turn within 30 feet of you. They have to make a wisdom saving throw, or else they are charmed by you. When they're charmed, their speed is zero and they're incapacitated. So this is basically an effect like hypnotic pattern. They do get a saving throw to escape this at the end of each of their subsequent turns, but unlike other effects that tend to incapacitate and reduce someone's speed to zero, they don't get a chance to get out of this when they get hit with an attack. So, so this feature is basically a stun that leaves them in a dreamy stupor where your allies can beat them up and you activated it as a reaction. I think that this is my second choice for a rune when we're starting off. So when we look at all the runes, fire rune and stone rune are my two pick picks. I completely agree. And I think it's going to be really hard to not want to pack both of these through most of your career. Although we'll have to make a difficult choice when we level up again. So when we go up to level seven we're going to be able to get a third rune in the mix, but we also unlock the hill and the storm runes. It's also worth noting that at this time we can retrain our runes, so right away at level 7, we could have both the hill and the storm rune if we wanted them. Let's talk about what these runes do and then talk about our picks. Sure. The hill rune passively gives you advantage on saving throws against being poisoned and gives you resistance to poison damage. When you invoke the rune, you actually gain resistance to piercing, slashing, and bludgeoning damage as well. This is kind of borrowing from the Barbarian and makes you a really good tank, and I think this is a must-have rune. Invoking the rune is a bonus action, and it lasts for one minute. Um, and it comes back on a short rest. So this is a very good way to just give yourself blanket resistance to the most common damage types for a whole fight. Let you feel like a barbarian without having to multi-class to be a barbarian. I completely agree with you, Kelly. I think you take this rune and don't look back. The storm rune gives you advantage on arcana checks passively, and you can no longer be surprised. Uh, interesting, but not being surprised is really handy. Now, the storm rune is also invoked as a bonus action, and its effect puts you in a prophetic state for one minute. During this time, as a reaction you can, when someone makes an attack roll, ability check, or saving throw, give them advantage or disadvantage on that attack roll, ability check, or saving throw. So basically, you're going to be handing out advantage or disadvantage to allies or enemies as you see fit once per turn for the next minute. I think that this is a really good use of your reaction, though, and if we're looking at builds that maybe don't have too many other things to do with your reaction, I think this is a prime pick as well. Mm. And I do think at level 7, I might drop the stone rune for now and pick up both the hill and storm rune. It's difficult to get both rolling at the same time, and you might not necessarily want to do that because also at level 7 you get the shield of runes, which is another reaction speed ability that lets you manipulate dice rolls as well. So you're kind of got you you kind of really have a lot of things to do with your reaction between shield of runes, 
opportunity attacks, the prophetic state of the storm rune, as well as being able to activate the stone rune. It, it's a lot of reaction stuff. So be careful about giving yourself a traffic jam of options to do with your reactions and bonus actions. This is a really big reason why taking Polar Master on a rune knight can be kind of challenging because you have so many things that you're doing with your bonus actions and reactions already. So now we've unlocked all of the runes. So as you're leveling up, it's really just a pick of the litter for what ones yeah. you want to take. For us, Fire Rune stays the whole time. Hill Giant, Storm Giant, I think I'm going to pick Cloud and then grab... I'm, I think I'm going to pick Stone back up and mm -hmm. finish it off with the Cloud Rune, leaving the Frost Rune aside. I, I think that that's probably the way to go as you, as you level things up. Of course, whenever you do gain a level, you can swap things out and you can mix and match. But but really, like I think that's the way to go with it right the the it's it sucks to not have the stone rune in your arsenal from level seven to level nine and then get it back again at level 10 because it is really good i like the idea of it but i do think that the other runes are far more effective than it there's a lot of options here uh that you can choose your favorite maybe the frost runes doing wonders for you in which case go for it but these are our choices, and we think that the Rune Knight actually presents a great and versatile option for what's going to be the best for you. Now, as we get into our feat choices, one thing about fighters is they are spoiled for feat choices. So we actually have a lot of opportunities to do our best and favorite mm -hmm. builds. Now, one thing I want to highlight before we go into our feat choices Monty and I are about to talk about some of the choices that you've heard us talk about in every other video that we've <laughs> ever done, but I specifically want to highlight why these are cool for a Rune Knight fighter. There are some really neat mechanics that come into play when we do our traditional big builds that fighters excel at. Yeah. I'm thinking off the bat, let's talk about why we might have some extra benefits from being a Polar Master great weapon master sentinel fighter well okay there's a few things at play here right off the bat the fire rune gives your character a built-in way of generating advantage against a single enemy that lasts a couple rounds and doesn't take away any of your actions to activate so that alone gives great weapon master or even sharpshooter a great opening here because you can hit somebody with an attack lock them in the fiery shackles and then that minus five penalty from great weapon master is counterbalanced by the fact that you now have advantage to attack the foes so that right off the bat is super super cool but giant's might is the other undersold feature of the rune knight that is going to make us a large large combatant on the battlefield we're taking up space yeah interestingly enough the Increase in size does not increase your reach. But something else does happen that is a little bit of a mechanical side of the game here. But the, if you're using minis in a battle map, mm -hmm. your miniature size goes from taking up one square to four squares. Yes. And then eventually at higher levels, eight squares? Nine squares. Nine squares. So what ends up happening here is your ability to use a pull arm and lock down enemies and hit enemies coming in towards you does increase in size yeah. as you do so you actually end up taking up more of the battlefield as a pull arm master sentinel it's it, the tough part here is it is hard to use that bonus action attack it, it is with, with all the abilities that you want to add in but it's worth noting like when you're a large creature and you have a 10 foot reach compared to a medium creature with a 10 foot reach a large creature with a 10 foot reach threatens this kind of board area that is six squares by six squares it's like a 30 foot wide bubble um and so that extra ring of squares that you're threatening is so much larger than even a medium creature who is a five like you hear a five foot a 25 foot by 25 foot area doesn't sound like a lot compared to a, a 30 foot by 30 foot area but it actually is a considerably larger number of squares that your character threatens 
Um, and so putting Polar Master into the mix of that, or even just using a reach weapon. And, and this is the whole thing, is that you could play the Rune Knight and not take Polar Master, but still use a Glaive or Halberd or a reach weapon just for that feature alone. And then you're not really worried about the traffic jam. But that reaction speed attack with Polar Master is super sweet. It's just that there's so many other things that are going to consume your reaction as a Rune Knight. Yeah, now the benefit yeah. of a fighter, though, is that we get so many feats that taking something that just gives you another option isn't the end of the world. So I yeah. do think that if you are looking at the Polar Master Sentinel Great Weapon Master build, the amount of space you take up on the battlefield is something to be considered. Mm -hmm. uh, when we look at another build option of taking your Sharpshooter, and yeah. maybe your crossbow expert, depending if you want the flavor of a bow or if you want to amp it up with a crossbow. Um, all of the features, all of the runes and abilities that we gain do not specify a melee attack. We know that a archer fighter can be really powerful on the yeah. battlefield. The ability yeah. to deal damage at a distance to anywhere in the battlefield is amazing and same thing with the great weapon master your minus five plus ten is countered by the ability to at range pin down a target with fiery shackles it's really cool the way that you can use these runes as a dexterity based archer fighter so that build is another option that again we've seen it many times we always talk about taking sharpshooter and crossbow expert but with a rune knight it works really well. You know, the one that doesn't work as well, I think, is Shield Master, unfortunately. Because Shield Master, you want to use that bonus action shove. You want to use that reaction to block things with uh, the, the reaction speed thing. It's, it's harder to make it work there. But one alternative that you could do in this case that is super thematic, I think, would be using a Maul and taking Crusher which is gonna give you that five foot kind of push shove that you get out of Shield Master, but then also really let you um, have, just feels right. A big character yeah. with a maul that's pushing people around the battlefield. So, although, although you could go with the shield, take Shield Master, wield a Warhammer in one hand and take Crusher, and maybe that would be something cool because again, once the runes are rolling, your bonus action isn't always going to be consumed. So you could have an interesting thing there with Crusher and Shield Master of being able to really knock people about and be that large and in-charge force. It's going to make you a little bit more of a brawler in that respect. There's also some interesting things to account for in the fact that because you are able to be a larger, huge creature with Giant's Might, you might be tempted to go down like the Tavern Brawler route and start grappling people or grabbing them and pinning them. I don't know if that's the way that I would go with the character, but it's it's tempting because it's there. <laughs> Beyond this, you're probably going to look at upping either your strength or dexterity, whatever yep. your primary one is. But I actually think more importantly, maxing out your constitution yeah, yeah. because all of your runes rely on constitution as your saving throw. So maxing out your constitution on a rune knight is actually really key. But with enough feet and ASI choices, we can do all of the above, well, depending on your build option. And I think that's actually what mm. makes the rune knight stand yeah. out to me is the versatility yeah. that's allowed within this class. I think we could actually do something really interesting here. Like if you played a hill dwarf not a mountain dwarf a hill dwarf which is the one that gives you the extra hit points as the rune knight took tough as a feat you could end up with a at max out the con score ton of hit points resistance to bludgeoning piercing and slashing damage so you super can build tanky, a tank super tanky and then of course the the hammer and the shield that just feels so dwarfy Right. So yeah. I think really the Rune Knight is a really well designed subclass. And I think what we're realizing in this build guide here is that you get to you get your pick of the litter for your favorite fighter build, much the same way that I feel you do when you play a battle master. Yeah, you just get a different flavor layered on top of it, right? I I, I think that the tricky thing with playing a Rune Knight as opposed to say a battle master, strategically speaking, is that aside from the runes like the hill rune and the storm rune that last for a minute, so you have them up for the entire encounter, the stone rune and the fire rune require you to be a little bit more strategic of when you're going to use those abilities because it's not until 15th level that you're going to be able to use them twice per encounter. Um, other, you get them back on a short rest, but in a given fight, 
you gotta you gotta choose the moment to use your rune right. That is the argument for actually still having Polar Master and Crossbow Expert because once all those things are down, once all your runes are down in a real knockdown drag out combat encounter, what else are you going to do with your reactions and bonus actions? If you do manage to play the character all the way up to 18th level and get Runic Juggernaut, you are going to increase your reach by five feet. Yeah. Uh, most campaigns aren't going to go this high, but if you are yeah. doing that big reach weapon build, you're covering almost the entire battlefield because you're now a huge creature. It's insane. I I love the Goliath carrying a glaive who is now a huge creature with the strength and might of a gargantuan creature yep. who is covering the entire battlefield with my Polar Master, Great Weapon Master, Sentinel. Uh, once I drop my runes down, I'm locking down enemies. I'm pinning them in place. Nothing's getting past me. That's the build that I would go for yeah. with my Rune Knight, and I think it's iconic and, and just beautiful. Yeah, I think for me, I really like what you get from being a half-orc here. I feel like the extra the extra damage on the crits, that extra like emergency endurance of going to one hit point instead of zero when you do get knocked down to zero, it's a really nice kind of survival strategy on such a tough character. But... You know, it's such a diverse build. I think that's what what makes the Rune Knight so exciting is that it's it's a different feel from a battle master. It has some quasi magical abilities that aren't just spells in the way that the Eldritch Knight is. Uh, and there's a lot of just fun and thematic stuff that all comes together in a really effective and versatile package. So this has been a look at building a Rune Knight in Dungeons & Dragons 5th Edition. If you've played a Rune Knight, tell us about your fun build options in the comments below. The videos that we create on our channel are made possible thanks to the incredible generosity of our Patreon supporters. If you enjoy the work that we do here on YouTube, Twitch, and elsewhere, please consider supporting our work by becoming a patron through the links below. And don't forget to check out our live play in the Worlds of Drakenheim, which airs Tuesday nights at 6pm Eastern on Twitch. You can find all the previous episodes right up over here. And we've got plenty more build guides for D&D 5e right up over here. Please subscribe to our channel so that you never miss an episode. Thanks so much for watching. We'll see you next time in, in the, the dungeon. dungeon.